Hello, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Welcome to episode number 95 of the Stop COVID Deaths webinar series brought to you by the University of the Philippines. Thank you for being part of our credible online community. And to all those who have just discovered us for today, welcome po at sana po marami po kayong matutunan sa ating webinar ngayong araw na ito at sa mga future webinars. There is a general sense of relief and an anticipation na nasa tail end na po tayo, patapos na po tayo sa pandemyang ito. And yet, as we enjoy yung ating newfound na kalayaan dito po sa Pilipinas, we hear of possible surges, spikes, uh, the potential of uh, the return of the lockdowns po, rising cases in neighboring parts of the ASEAN region. So, ano po ba yung mga katanungan sa isip natin? Ano po ba yung mga variant na, na kumakalat po, let's say, sa China, na nagresulta sa lockdown of 25 million oh, uh, just in the city of Shanghai? What variant has been increasing in uh, the cases in South Korea? A few days ago, the World Health Organization also announced that it was closely monitoring yung pong pinakabago pong variant called Omicron XE. It's a subvariant and a hybrid from two different types of the subvariants and could emerge to be a more transmissible variant than the recent BA.2 ng Omicron. So, posible po ba na ang mga new emerging variants na ito na napag-uusapan, closely being monitored, ay pwede po ba mas maging contagious kaysa po sa Omicron? Sa episode po natin for today, we will discuss... Uh, the possibility if we will have another COVID-19 surge uh, together with our panel of distinguished experts. I'm Dr. Raymond Francis Sarmiento, Director of National Telehealth Center, National Institutes of Health, University of the Philippines, Manila. Always a pleasure to be with all of you during our regular Friday lunch date, ang ating Friday po na tinatawag. And I always look forward to Fridays because I get to share uh, hosting duties with our adjunct faculty at the National Telehealth Center, also the Special Envoy of the President on Global Health Initiatives, Dr. Susie Pineda Mercado. Dr. Susie? Hi, good afternoon, Raymond. Magandang hapon po sa inyo lahat. I hope you're all okay. Uh, Raymond, may allergy ako. Kaya di tingin mo, singit na singit ako ngayon. <laughs> Some kind of thing in the air. Anyway, I hope everyone's all right. Uh, I was so scared kasi inuubo ako. Meron akong Sipon, nag-antigen test ako, negative naman, di ba? Pero ano, ano eh, no? parang we're always, uh, what should I say? We're also always being vigilant. We always have to take care if we have any symptoms. And uh, I'm just so happy everyone is here. Although I heard, I don't know if we resolved it, Raymond, no? Parang I heard na hindi makapasok yung iba sa Zoom because of the password. So mm, okay. we're looking into it. So kung yung mga kasama niyo hindi makapasok, sabihin niyo punta muna sila sa Facebook o sa YouTube and we'll post now on the chat. Uh, we'll post in the chat the, ano, the... Si Ross kasi bumati, tuloy na, dis, na, na, na distract ako. Maganda daw yung mga book natin. <laughs> <laughs> Ross, how are you? I hope you're fine. Um, so anyway, uh, the, we'll put on the chat the, ano, no, the Facebook and YouTube link so that you can ask your your friends to go there just in case hindi sila makapasok. But the password, Raymond, is... What is it? Webinar, Webinar 95. 95. Capital W. 95 na! <laughs> 95 na! Okay, so anyway, welcome everyone. Um, We we are um very happy to talk about... To have some experts with us. Again, we only bring you the best. no? So, ano, ano nagpapasalamat talaga ako dito sa mga experts natin kasi... Sobrang busy nila, pero pag kayo ang karap, may time sila, no? So we have two very distinguished guests who are going to talk about, uh, you know, what, what's going to happen, no? Kasi okay na tayo, medyo nag-open up na tayo sa Philippines. And yet, sabi nga ni Raymond, merong, ano, no? merong mga ibang lugar na nagsusurge na naman sila. Parang, ano ba yan? So, vaccination has had an impact, okay? So, Importante talaga yung campaign natin for vaccination. And ngayon, tulungan niyo po kami. Ano, we're campaigning for the vaccination of children. So malaking epekto rin yan. Pero ngayon, syempre, kinakabahan tayo Holy Week. Mag-uuwian, di ba? Uh, palagay ko marami sa inyong uuwi. Eh. Lagay niyo nga sa chat kung uuwi kayo, sa kayo pupunta. Curious lang ako eh. Uuwi kayo, di ba? So, ano no, parang, uh, you know, that that could be a source of, Uh, you know, some exposure. And then, of course, the elections, no? nakikita natin yung marali, daming tao. Sa bagay, outdoor naman yung karamihan. 
Pero pag-usapan natin yung mga yan kasi ah, syempre, alam mo, ayaw natin na kumalat uli yung COVID and of course the question is, meron pa bang mga mutation dyan? So meron tayong nababasa ngayon na Omicron XE, o oh, unang-unan yung narinig dito sa Stop COVID Deaths. Ano ba yung XE na yon? Alamin natin mamaya. Sige, so meron tayong, ano, meron tayong uh, we've got a full pack schedule today, but uh, as said, you have the best speakers with you on Stop COVID Deaths. Okay, Raymond, over to you. Thank you so much, Dr. Susie. Uh, today po, we will be putting our webinar into focus uh, by putting it into some sort of context po oh, via a video that has been prepared by TVUP. Ang tawag po namin dito ay Person on the Street Interview Video or POTS. And we really want to take the pulse uh, of the common person po from the street. And the uh, question that we post uh, to our interviewees is, do you think that the COVID-19 pandemic has ended? At sa tingin po ninyo, bakit nyo po ito nasabi? Please watch this. I think hindi pa rin talaga nag-end yung pandemic. Even though medyo free na ngayon, like this, nakakalakad-lakad tayo ngayon sa, sa Oval. Hindi, kasi kahit na nilit naman ng government natin yung restriction, hindi naman ibig sabihin nun na cleared na yung COVID. Tsaka yun nga, hindi natin dapat ibababa yung guards natin. Hindi naman po basta, basta agad yung nawawala yung virus, lalo na din hindi natin siya nakikita. Kaya hindi tayo sure kung wala na ba talaga yung virus. Matagal ba yung... Pan... Mag-normal yung panahon eh. At nung la, 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 may bakuna para safety na tayo. Though, dahil nga nagluwag tayo sa Pilipinas, yung mga tao, mas ano na sila, mas parang do aware sila, pero parang binaba pa rin natin yung guard natin sa pandemic. Kahit na feeling ko nag, uh, may mga vaccine na and uh, booster shots, hindi pa rin siya uh, totally 100% nawala na yung pandemic. Sa tingin ko po, kung uh, niluwagan na nila agad-agad dahil nga po nagka-election, di ba? Hindi sila makapag-debate, yung yung bang ginagawa nila ngayon, ngayong election, yung nagpaparade sila, yung ganyan. Sa isip ko lang po, kaya nila niluwagan dahil doon. Siguro, matatapos na yung pandemic kapag around 70% to 80% na siguro ng total population sa world population siguro. Tulad nga yan, na-encounter ko sa, ba, sa mga pamilihan. Crowded na po yung mga tao. So may mga nagtatanggal pa ng face mask. Kasi hindi na ganun kahigpet. Number one talaga dyan, dapat mga ano nila, na fully vaccinated na yung buong Pilipinas. Pre, eh, mahirap yung maganap buhay na ano eh. Katol ng ganto. Eh, mahina sa ngayon kasi, yun nga, pandemic. Eh, sa ngayon, wala pa eh. Tama-tama lang, kumita lang konti kung pagkain lang. Ay, ano na lang talaga nila yung pag-screen, lalo na yung mga international na mga pisita, tourist. Tingkitan na lang nila yung screening siguro. Pero depende po kasi sa tao eh. May, marami naman pong sumusunod. Kaso nga lang, hindi natin maiiwasan yung tao na hindi sumusunod sa mga protocols po. Tulad na lang ng, alam mo yung may mga sa distant tao na pag nagtanggal sila ng face mask nila, tapos sinita mo sila pagalit. Sana mas guided pa yung mga tao sa atin ng government. Uh, especially those people na uh, hindi ganun kasapat yung uh, nakukuha na info about the pandemic. Uh, then para sa mga tao, mas maging maingat pa tayo kasi isa lang yung buhay natin. Uh, lalo na kung uh, hindi, wala tayong choice kundi lumabas para magtrabaho. Uh, yun, doble ingat lang. Okay, thank you very much, TVUP. Naka very interesting, Raymond. Ano? Parang tingin ko mga tao, okay, they're enjoying the, they're enjoying the freedom, but they're also thinking na okay, we still have to, ano, no, we still have to be, to be careful. So I think some of these health messages have really, have really um, hit the mark. Pero sabi ng iba, not everyone, di ba? Not everyone is thinking that way. Okay, so 
Um, thank you so much, TVUP. I think that's always very nice to start that way. And uh, just a little bit of reminder, we're celebrating our oh, second year anniversary, Raymond. Ano ba yan? Two years na. Di pa tayo nagkikita, but... Uh, <laughs> Okay, and, and on our anniversary, as always, we, um, we want to remember our frontliners who gave the ultimate uh, offering, sacrificing their lives uh, for the pandemic. And again, when, when we look back on the history of the pandemic in the Philippines, we should always remember no, na marami sa ating mga frontliners, eh talagang, ano, no, talagang uh, they didn't make it. Okay, they didn't make it. They were doing their duty in the line of duty na tamaan sila. So we are asking everyone to, if you have friends or family who uh, who passed away during the pandemic, please send us uh, a photo on or before April 9. Uy, bukas na yun na. 5 p.m. Tama ba yun, Raymond? Tomorrow, okay? To TV, television at up.edu.ph and we need a high resolution portrait photo at least 300 dots per inch full name date of birth date of death and the occupation so thank you very much and for those who who are planning to send padala niyo na para tapos na masama na natin dun sa ating memorial okay raymond over to you thank you dr susi uh, yes that's correct po tomorrow na po ang ating deadline at 5 pm uh, hopefully, you'll be able to send out ang inyong mga pictures, maybe a little bit of uh, short anecdote po. We are seeing, uh, actually we just saw um, in Messenger po, may mga nagbi-message kung pwede pa pong mag-submit. Yes, pwede pa rin po kayo mag-submit as part of our COVID-19 Heroes Memorial. Uh, we want to be able to, well, uh, as you know, the Filipino medical frontliners have been recognized as the best in the world and we we hope to be able to um, immortalized and may remember them and their selfless contributions in the fight against COVID-19. Uh, just to let you know, uh, at least we, uh, well, right now po kasi we have a little over 600 participants in the Zoom, but we are able to accommodate up to a maximum of 3,000 participants. So please join us in Zoom so you can fully experience this interactive program. But if you are watching right now in YouTube or Facebook having these watch parties, uh, hopefully you're also still able to engage with us by putting in your comments sa comment section po and also participating mamaya sa ating fun quiz. For those who are asking, we have already uh, distributed the certificates for all 93 webinars po. No? May mailan-ilan pa po na pin pinapa... Uh, send out po namin for webinar number 94 and these are the certificates of attendance. Again, those who have watched at least 50% of the webinar duration, sila lang po ang makatatanggap ng certificate of attendance. And also a link dun po sa mga um, materials that we have the, that were used during the webinar po. We also would like to invite everyone to participate in our fun mini quiz which will be held dito po both in Zoom pwede eh, pwede rin po kayo sumali kung sasali po kayo sa Mentimeter if you open your internet browser and you type in www.menti.com and when you are prompted use the code 49226009 that's 49226009 for you to be able to participate in our fun quiz we will be utilizing our standard panel discussion format uh, wherein we have our speakers presenting a q and a session will ensue thereafter well, with questions being selected from zoom Facebook and YouTube. So if you are selected po, no, may makita po kayong prompt kunya rin po sa Zoom uh, being as if you want to ask your question uh, and participate as a, a part of the panel, please sana po paunlakan niyo po kami para po maitanong niyo po ng live ang inyong katanungan sa ating panel of experts. And without further ado, Dr. Susie will now introduce our opening remarks speaker. Okay, thank you, Raymond. Marami kasi sa atin mga ano, eh, shy. Camera shy sila. Pero ang kaganda naman ng mga tanong, no? So kung meron kayong question mamaya, sana makasama kayo sa, ano, sa, sa, sa on, on cam. Pero kung hindi, okay lang din, we'll ask your questions. Okay, so for today, let's start. We have an opening spe speaker who is one of our favorites. Many of you don't know siguro, no? Raymond, ikaw din siguro naalala to, no? Yung National Institutes of Health of the University of the Philippines in Manila that was created by law. No, and I remember before, the one who was really pushing for it was the late Dr. Perla Santos Ocampo. And it was her dream na magkaroon ng NIH. Kasi 
sa ibang bansa, meron talagang parang leading research uh, institute for health. No? And then merong centers for disease control. Magkaiba yun eh. Parang yung CDC more of nagmamonitor ng mga ano ng mga outbreak ng mga gumagawa ng surveillance no and uh, i think John mentioned this uh, earlier oh by the way so nas na mention ko na rin no John Wong is going to be one of our speakers today so i mentioned this na magkakaroon na tayo ng centers for disease control but na una itong National Institutes for Health and we are very very privileged to have the National Institutes of Health really at the core of a lot of the work that we're doing no parang Uh, naalala ko in the early days when we were starting, talagang full support, no? And besides, boss ni Raymond dito, eh, no? Kasi ang National Telehealth Center nasa National Institutes of Health. So, it is our privilege to welcome the Executive Director and uh, Vice Chancellor of UP Manila, uh, Executive Director of the National Institutes of Health, Dr. Eva Kutyonko de La Paz. Eva, welcome to the webinar. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, start my video. Thank you, Dr. Susie. Hello, Dr. Raymond, Dr. Susie. Always a pleasure to be here. Um, may correction lang po ako. Ma'am Susie, we were able to separate already the uh, Vice Chancellor from the Executive Director of uh, the National oh, Institute. Oh, ano Yes. Okay. okay. We have a new Vice Chancellor for Research. That's already Dr. Edward Wang. He's the OIC following after Dr. Chrysostomo. And uh, okay. I'm I'm happy to inform you, Paul, that uh, we had uh, as of uh, before March of 2022, we had 14 institutes and centers of the National Institutes of Health, uh, and that includes, of course, the National Telehealth Center. But now, uh, last uh, the last week of March during the BOR, um, the last meeting of the B the Board of Regents, they have approved the NIH National Clinical Trials and Translation Center, Paul. So that's the latest from the National Institutes of Health. I'm here to deliver my opening remarks. Welcome everyone to the 95th University of the Philippines Stop COVID Deaths webinar series. In the last few weeks, uh, Filipinos have experienced freedom to be out of their homes. Finally, after two years, we see children playing outside and also traveling with their lolos and lolas in tourist destinations around the country, going to the malls, eating out, and just enjoying this newfound freedom. Sabi nga ni Dr. Raymond, mga bagong laya. Uh, kanina, sabi niya yon. As part of the task force on COVID-19 variants, we have been asked many times, have we reached the end of the pandemic? That was your question too, Dr. Susie. Why are there surges in Hong Kong, South Korea, and other places while cases in our country continue to go down, will we be experience, experiencing another surge soon? We are witnessing different patterns of BA.2 infections in different countries across the globe. Experts say that in some parts of the world, hospitalizations and deaths due to BA.2 increased, like uh, in the UK, together with the rise in cases. But other countries, report only a small increase and the surges were short-lived and did not impact uh, tremendously to the hospitalization. Public health specialists predict that areas with lower vaccination rates and higher population density and also places where people spend more time inside will be more likely to have a rise in cases and have new surges. Do we need to be concerned about the emergence of new variants of concern and how soon Will they be coming to our shores? Experts in infectious diseases have laid down some important facts. Fact number one is that the virus is going to continue to circulate. Fact number two, areas that have lower population density or high vaccination rates are probably going to experience less illness. And fact number three, with so many people infected with Omicron, they believe Experts believe that it could provide some protection against BA.2 and lessen its impact. So many questions still need to be answered, which keeps us all on the edge of our seats. And today's TVUP's Stop COVID Deaths webinar, webinar is so relevant and timely with experts Dr. John Wong from Epimetrics and Dr. Cynthia Saloma of the Philippine Genome Center joining us today. 
whether the next wave is due to VA.2 or another COVID-19 variant, it pays to be prepared. So what better way to be prepared for another variant or another surge than to stay informed through this very educational TVUP webinar. Before I end, the NIH extends its deepest gratitude to the people who made this program running successfully for almost two years, or actually not almost two years, for more than two years now. So UPVP Public Affairs Professor Elena Pernia, uh, AVP Maria Angelica Abad, AVP Jose Wendell uh, Capilli, TVUP Executive Director Professor Emeritus Grace Javier Alonso and her TVUP team, and UP Manila Chancellor Carmen Cita Padilla, and of course, Dr. Susi Mercado and Dr. Raymond Sarpiento are very engaging hosts who I think have a huge fan base by now. They make everyone just want to come back every week. So have a good and productive afternoon learning from our experts. Back to you, Dr. Raymond and Dr. Susi. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you so much. That's uh, that's Dr. Eva Cotillonco de la Paz, the head of the National Institutes of Health. And uh, Eva, we were looking forward to having you in the in the open forum and thank you for framing our uh, our uh, webinar so what should i say so concisely you know parang nahuli talaga ni Eva lahat yung pag-uusapan okay Raymond over to you thank you Dr. Susi and thank you to my boss also Dr. Eva for really inspiring us uh, just to know more about our today's topic um, we want to remind everyone din po that the Q&A session uh, for this webinar uh, we will be picking questions uh, that you will be putting in the Q&A box for Zoom and then may, and then also um, in the comment section for YouTube and Facebook. So please go ahead. If you already have any questions in my, please go ahead and type them in. Uh, we encourage everyone to really participate in this Q&A session uh, so that uh, you'll be able to really gain more of the uh, interaction and the engagement uh, with us. Uh, before we proceed, we'll ask everyone to participate dito po sa ating fun mini quiz. Nakikita nyo na po ito on your screen. There, uh, it's the same two questions that we have for Zoom and for Mentimeter. So the first question po, uh, ganun po ulit, no? <laughs> English and then Tagalog po ulit yung questions natin. First question reads, what is Omicron XE? Is it a hybrid of Omicron and Delta? Is it a hybrid of Omicron BA.1 and BA.2? Or it's a hybrid of two variants of the Delta po? So, eh, yun, alin po ba dito sa ating tatlong choices ang tama pong uh, option or uh, tama pong kasagutan to the question, what is Omicron X? He would like to greet those who are joining us from the City Health Office in Dagupan, Pangasinan, from the Notre Dame de Chartres Hospital in Baguio City, Agoncillo Rural Health Unit in Batangas, Bicol Regional Training and Teaching Hospital in Legazpi City, Albay, Xavier University, Ateneo de Cagayan in Cagayan de Oro City. For question number two, anong mga bansa ang meron ng Omicron XE? Um, Multiple choice po ito. No? So you'll, you'll really have to choose uh, multiple answers for this question. Ito po ba ay sa United Kingdom? Ito po ba ay sa Estados Unidos? Uh, ito po ba ay may kita na sa India? Or sa China? Or sa Thailand? So we have five options here. Feel free to select po kung alin po dito ang mga uh, bansa na naapektuhan din po na meron na pong kaso ng Omicron XE. Uh, we'd like to greet naman po those who are joining us internationally uh, watching from the Ministry of Health in Bandar Seri, Bigawan, in Brunei, from Taipei, uh, Taiwan, from Kantot, Vietnam, University of Ha'il in Saudi Arabia, Kwasim University in Buraida, Saudi Arabia, Kim Saud bin Abdulaziz University for Health Sciences in Jeddah, Lunichi Ali University of Blida II in Algeria, Burbank and Carson in California, Clark, New Jersey, Edmonton, Alberta, Canada, and St. Eustatius Auxiliary Home Foundation from the Netherlands, Antilles. We will not be closing po muna ang ating uh, fun mini quiz. We are seeing that uh, medyo kalahati pa lang po ang nakakasali sa ating uh, fun mini quiz. We hope more and more are able to participate. And then now, we'll call on Dr. Susie to let, so we can go ahead to our webinar proper. Okay, thank you very much, Raymond. No, Ang cute na naman yung mga gumagalaw-galaw na ano dyan. Parang mga, ano ba ito? Parang mga ano eh, mga... 
Naisip molecules. <laughs> molecules. Okay. So, okay. So, thank you very much for engaging in that. And yung ba sa inyo, alam ko, nag-google habang tinitingnan yan. Okay lang yan. Okay lang sa atin yan. Kasi, ano eh, parang, uh, you know, we want you to leave the webinar with some new knowledge that you really, ano, really, really remember. So that if people ask you, then you've got a good answer. Okay. So, uh, let's go. Our first guest. And sabi nga natin, we bring you only the best speakers. No? And throughout the two years, Raymond, uh, we have a favorite go-to epidemiologist. No? And I think this past two years has really been a good time for public health na biglang naiintindihan ng mga tao na bakit mahalaga yung public health, bakit mahalaga yung epidemiology. Dati kasi ano ba yung ginagawa nila bilang sila ng bilang. Ngayon nakikita natin gano'ng kahalaga yung meron tayong mga naaasahan na mahuhusay na mga doktor, di ba, na nag-aral ng public health na ang field nila ay eh, talagang ano no, bilangin para malaman natin kung, kung ano talagang nangyayari. So our go-to for epidemiology has always been Dr. John Wong, who is the Senior Technical Advisor of Epimetrics. And uh, we always like to have John on, on the webinar because he's very calm and very tempered. No? Parang pag nagsalita si John, nakikinig tayong lahat. Eh. Kasi ano pa talaga yung sinasabi niya? Di ba? Kasi parang, ano, parang pinag-isipan niya ng mabuti yung sasabihin niya. So right now, given this question that we have, eh, ano, no? are there more contagious variants at meron bang surge ulit? Pakinggan po natin si Dr. John Wong. Uh, John, welcome to the webinar. Nice to have you here. Uh, thank you, Susie. Uh, good afternoon. Uh, good afternoon to everyone. Uh, hi, Raymond. Um, <clears throat> should I start? Yeah, go. Go, John. The floor Go is ahead. yours. Can you see my slides? Yes, yes. Perfect. Go ahead. Okay, uh, so good afternoon. Uh, I'll try to answer the question. Is a new COVID wave uh, coming? No? <clears throat> so let's start with uh, a short, a short or a brief answer. No, so in epidemiology, let me get my pointer. Uh, we like to think of disease diseases in this way. No, uh, it's not just the the agent, no, the the virus, bacteria, or uh, fungi you know, that causes disease. You know? uh, whether or not disease is produced also depends on the host, you know, people, and the environment. You know? So if you look at COVID this way and the, and the possibility of a new surge this way, uh, whether or not we will have one you know, will depend on uh, the occurrence of new virus variants, how much immunity the population has, how people behave, and how healthy the environment is. The environment is you know? So let's let's break it down, no? Uh, so let's go back to our uh, favorite, no? Uh, SEI mo SEIR model uh, for uh, looking at the pandemic. No? So again, no, uh, the population can be divided into several buckets or compartments. No? So people started out susceptible. You know, the population started out susceptible in March 2020. You no. Know? Uh, eventually, uh, a lot of people got exposed. A lot of them got infected. Most recovered, no? but, but unfortunately, some people died. No? Uh, March of last year, uh, we had vaccines. No? Our vaccination program started. So uh, a lot more people got immune. No? Uh, and people who recovered, no, we're also finding out that uh, they, they actually have uh, some immunity also. No? So, so this is the state of the pandemic now. No? Of our 110 million population, no? uh, only about some 41 million is susceptible. No? Uh, the, we only have about 34,000 infectious cases. About 3.6 million have recovered and 59,000 have died. No? Uh, so adding uh, the people who have been fully vaccinated, no? about 65 million. No? And the people who recovered, you know, we have about 69 million who have uh, immunity. Uh, so are we in a good place? Uh, well, we're in a better place than two years ago. You know? uh, but I don't think we're in a good place yet. You know? Because of this for 41 million, you know, 
uh, maybe 3% of them will get infected no, if they don't get vaccinated. And about 1% of that no, will be, will, will, will die no, or succumb to the virus. No? So that's about 21,000 people who are still likely to die no, if they don't get vaccinated. So look, let's look at each of these factors no, that can cause uh, a surge. No? So let's start with the virus. No? So uh, viruses can, can mutate, no, as we know. No? So they can mutate to become resistant to the vaccine. No? We call this immune escape. No? So people may be vaccinated, but they may not develop immunity. No? Second, uh, they may mutate more transmissible. And actually, this is... This is their goal. No? Uh, it per gives them an advantage over other variants. So they want they want to mutate to be more transmissible so that they will survive. No? So uh, when they do that, then they become more transmissible or have shorter incub incubation period, which re results in the same thing, no? uh, faster transmission, no? which is which which is what we saw with Omicron. No? Uh, they can also mutate to become more virulent or, or more dangerous. No? Uh, uh, before we go to the next factor, uh, let, let me go back one slide. Now, um, this this uh, recovered patients who develop immunity. Now, uh, this uh, we're we're realizing also that this is an important factor. No, so uh, a recent question people have been asking is uh, how come we we've never except for South Africa? No, how come we've never seen uh, large surges? No, or large number of deaths in Africa? Uh, recently, they've seen that uh, about two thirds of Africans no, have been infected with COVID, no? but we don't see that same number no, in the reported cases no? uh, because uh, they don't have uh, sufficient testing uh, capabilities. No? Uh, the same we, we saw the same in India. No? India had a very large Delta wave. No? Uh, they also had a large Omicron wave, but. Uh, paradoxically, it was smaller than uh, Delta, even though Omicron was more transmissible. It was because after Delta, about two thirds of uh, people in India uh, had already developed immunity no, or had already been infected uh, and also not reported. No. Uh, so going to the second factor, uh, what about how, how do people no, uh, contribute to, to a surge or to disease? No? Uh, do they have confidence no, in the vaccine or in the vaccination program? No? So this uh, this will increase or or uh, slow down no, the immunization program. Uh, are they compliant no, to minimum public health standards? No? Distancing, wearing masks. No? Uh, and even if they're vaccinated, no, uh, just being elderly or having comorbidities no, can put them at risk for, for death. No? So for example, in the Philippines, no, about uh, 80 percent of people who have died no, of this 59,000, about 80 percent are 50 years old and above. No. Um, comorbidities, no, especially diabetes, no, also multiply their risk no, of dying. Uh, and that's why they were priorities no, for the vaccination program. Uh, I should also add that uh, uh, of the people who have not been vaccinated, no, uh, about 35% of the elderly are also not are still not vaccinated. No? So these are the people most most at risk no? for, for death. Uh, and lastly, how does the environment contribute to, the, to disease? No? Uh, we know that uh, <clears throat> COVID is airborne, no? so better ventilation no? uh, prevents prevents disease. No? And there seems to be uh, well, at least in temperate countries, no. Seasonality no, is a major factor no, in, in the spread of disease. No? Uh, when it's colder, people tend to stay indoors, and that increases the risk no, for transmission. So let's look at the virus. No? So it, uh, viruses can mutate to become more transmissible uh, because they become stickier no, to the respiratory tract, or they have shorter incubation periods. No? Uh, this gives them evolutionary advantage. No? And uh, the variants that have emerged no, have emerged pre precisely because of this. No? Uh, every variant has become more, has, is more transmissible no, than the previous. Uh, another way that um, variants gain advantage over uh, other variants are 
if they also uh, have immune escape, no? if they can reduce the vaccine effect effectiveness. No? And this is because uh, if the vaccine doesn't kill them, then they can uh, transmit no? or spread to other people. No? So uh, we've seen that Omicron uh, reduce the effectiveness of the vaccine by a lot. No? Uh, so it become, became more transmissible even among people who were vaccinated. Uh, however, among uh, however, for immunity against severe disease, no, it only affected those who were elderly and persons with, with comorbidities. No? But for the rest of the population, no, uh, they still retain their immunity against severe disease. No? Uh, and we saw this, no? previous, uh, previous infections produce stronger immunity than full, full vaccination. No? So, um, so we know that Omicron uh, had about a 60% reduced uh, severity no, compared to compared to Delta, no? but of the sixty percent, about a third, only about a third, no, is due to the uh, inherent uh, mildness of the virus. No? Uh, about two thirds of this reduced uh, virulence no, is actually was actually due to stronger immunity no, because of previous infections. Uh, and then, virulence. What about virulence? No? Uh, Variants can become vir more virulent or more dangerous if they penetrate deeper no, in the respiratory tract. No. But this is a characteristic of the virus that uh, viruses don't care about. No. They become more virulent or they become less virulent. No. But there's no intention for viruses to mutate towards less virulence. No. Uh, that, that was a misconception no, that people had earlier. No. Viruses always mutate towards higher transmissibility and less virulence. No? So Delta proved otherwise. No? It was um, more transmissible, but also more virulent. So there's no preference for less virulence no? as viruses has evolved. Uh, okay, what about uh, XE, no? the XE variant? No? So, so we see here the, um, the, line the lineages of the, of the viruses. No? So, this is the original variant. No? This is Delta, uh, and then this is Omicron. No? The two variants of subvariants of Omicron. Uh, so they're very different from each other. No? So most people expected that the next variant after Delta would have emerged from Delta. No? It turned out that Omicron was emerged from separately no? and was very different from Delta. No? Uh, and then under Delta, no, there were other variants no, or subvariants. No? These are called recombinations because they're uh, combinations of either delta, BA1, or BA2. No? So XE no, is a recombinant of BA1 and BA2. No? So far, uh, it's just a variant under monitoring, no? not a variant of concern. Uh, we should also know that uh, recombinants are actually very common. No? So now uh, a lot of people are talking about XE. No? Uh, but there, there had actually been previously X, A, B, C, and D, uh, which emerged and then died out. No? So not all subvariants no, are dangerous. No? So X, E was, uh, uh, well, that they're not found only in UK now, but most of the cases have been in UK. Uh, but I think only because UK has one of the strongest, if not the strongest, uh, genomic surveillance systems in the world. No? Um, so they found that it's 10% more transmissible than BA2, uh, but because of the very small numbers, no, they still can't tell whether it's more severe or it has uh, immune escape properties. No? Uh, uh, but having said that, no, we know that vaccination and, and previous infection could reduce the impact no, of uh, any new variants. No? Uh, but just the same, no, we still need to control spread no, because Transmission causes mutation. Uh, so this is just a, a map no, of how the variants have evolved to become more contagious no, and uh, more resistant to the virus. No? So this original strain, alpha, beta, delta, and Omicron is really uh, factors away no, from, from all the other variants. No? So this is a, 
uh, a map of uh, the amino acids no? uh, of the omicro uh, of the of the COVID virus no? that uh, are targeted by the vaccine. No? So these are all the uh, targeted amino acids. No? Delta had two mutations, no? so that's why uh, that's why Delta no? had only a slight reduced effectiveness no? against the or the vaccine had only slight reduced uh, effectiveness against Delta. No? Omicron, on the other hand, had 15 mutations. No? So that's why uh, effectiveness against Omicron was more uh, was great, uh, reduced to a greater degree no, compared to Delta. However, uh, each of these 200 amino acids that the vaccines target no, can mutate 19 times. No? So if you take this, no, it mutated once here, no, it can mutate 18 other times. No? So there are about 4,000 possible, uh, well, to be exact, no, 3,800 possible mutations no, uh, or directions into which uh, COVID can mutate. No? And we have only experienced a few of them. No? So viral evolution, evolution has not ended with Omicron. No? So Omicron is not going to be the end of the pandemic. Uh, since the start of the pandemic, no, uh, scientists have documented 400 mutations no, that make that uh, make the virus uh, that uh, the, the vaccines no, uh, uh, are affected no, uh, with. No. Uh, however, this is just a small subset no, of all the possible ways no, that uh, the variant can still mutate. No. And still possibly infect human cells. Okay, so we're still a long way away, uh, long, long way away, no, from uh, being immune, no, uh, from the virus, no, with or without vaccines. So, what is what do scientists think is the most likely path of COVID of, uh, virus evolution? No? Uh, so it's not the end. Uh, they will always evolve to become more transmissible. Uh, immune escape helps them become more transmissible, uh, whether, but whether or not they become more or less virulent no, is left to chance. No? So Delta is more virulent, Omicron is less virulent. No? We don't know what the next one would be. No? Uh, in the long term, no, scientists believe that COVID-19 will probably be like the flu. No? How is it? How, how will it be like the flu? No? Uh, so it will become seasonal, meaning Every year, you know, there will be variants, you know, and and because of these variants, you know, uh, people may be more or less susceptible. You know, so that makes it seasonal, you know. and epidemics are still possible, you know, depending on whether there is immune escape you know, from the virus. You know. So we will need uh, probably annual boosters, you know, uh, but this is what scientists are working on: you know, vaccines that are variant-proof, you know, so that we don't need to change vaccines. You know. Uh, uh, with every variant, so we so far no, we haven't changed the original uh, after the emergence of alpha, beta, delta, or even omicron. No? Um, on the other hand, no, for for the flu vaccine, no, uh, we're able to come up with a, a new formulation every year. No, but uh, these are not always effective no? uh, to to the same to the same degree as if we're if we're working from uh, a real genetic map no, of the virus. So how about people? No? How, how, how can people influence disease? No? Um, so let's first look at immunity. No? So, so this is what we call the immunity wall. No? So uh, these people, so this is by regions. No? These people have the strongest immunity. No? They're vaccinated and they're boosted. No? These people also have good immunity. No? But not as strong, no. They're vaccinated, but not boosted. No? This is where our immunity is porous, no. Uh, the light green area, no. They're part, only partially vaccinated. Okay, uh, so they'll get breakthrough infections, no, and some of them can get, even get severe disease, no. And this is where we're missing parts of the wall, no. And the virus can or uh, easily jump over it, no. So this is a this is the part that we need to fill up. So we've seen that uh, NCR uh, has always led, no? and part of this reason is because 
uh, when we didn't have enough supply, no, up to maybe November last year, no, uh, this the top three regions had uh, uh, were were given uh, two times more doses, no, compared to the bottom three regions. Uh, so there was inequity, no, geographic inequity, no, in terms of distribution. Um, if you look at age groups, no, uh, we actually also have a uh, low uh, a low boosting wall, uh, higher fully vaccinated wall, but still a large proportion of the population that are not protected no, or sus still susceptible, especially among children. So it's uh, the immunity wall is incomplete no, and uh, porous. So what's what's keeping people from being vaccinated? No, um, the the story has always been told that it's because of vaccine hesitancy. No, but uh, that's actually not true. No, uh, so when the when the program started March 2021 no, and vaccine immunity was measured, no, it was about 30 percent. No, quite low. No, but uh, from this graph we see that uh, across the whole length of the or duration of the immunization. Uh, vaccination program, no? uh, acceptance no? has always exceeded supply. No? Uh, this is the, the yellow the yellow graph. No? So there has always been a gap. No? So that means that uh, all throughout last year, more people have always been uh, wanted to be vaccinated compared to what is available. No? Supply only caught up uh, end of last year. Uh, but now a new New problems emerged. No? So, if 85% uh, uh, of the population want to be vaccinated, no? uh, there's still a gap between that no? and people who actually got vaccinated. No? This is about 59%. No? So, from being a, a vaccine supply gap, now we have a vaccine access gap. No? So, in uh, in the last mile, no? uh, getting people getting doses from from the health centers or the vaccination centers into the arms of people. You know, this is the gap now, you know, the logistics gap. So we've done a survey uh, among the elderly of what's preventing them from getting vaccinated. You know. The top reasons are, as you can see, you know, uh, logistical reasons, you know, waiting times too long, they have physical limitations, mobility issues you know, that prevent them from going on their own. It's difficult for them to find an, or make an appointment, especially if appointments are made uh, online or digitally, you know, and it's too far away. You know, the vaccination centers are too far away. Uh, if you read through all of this, the, most of these are logistical issues. Okay, so moving from immunity to behaviors, you know, uh, what type of behaviors you know, prevent, uh, we can prevent another surge, you know, uh, getting vaccinated and, bo and boosted, you know, and ensuring good ventilation wherever you are, if you're outdoors, no, you certainly have good ventilation. If you're if you're indoors, you have to make sure that uh, there's inflow and exhaust of air. You're wearing masks with of good of good of good quality, no, you uh, N95, uh, K94, or KF94, no, uh, and you keep distance, no. Uh, but now the cases are 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 very low, no. Uh, sometimes. Um, and people have pandemic fatigue. No, it's difficult to always practice all four of these. No, so uh, let me introduce this uh, three out three out of four rule. No, so the three out of four rule says that uh, if you can satisfy three conditions, no, you can skip the fourth. No, so for example, if you're vaccinated, no, uh, you're in a room with good ventilation. No, and if you're distance, no, you may not need to mask. Or if you mask, no. You can stay closer together, or on the other hand, no. Uh, let's say you're um, outdoors jogging. No, if you get vaccinated, if you are vaccinated and you have good ventilation, and you're uh, alone, no, uh, uh, in a park, for example, running or jogging, no, you may not need to mask. No, so this is a good rule to to observe, no, to uh, be able to carry on with uh, normal lives. No? Uh, there are also several rules of thumb no, that you can follow uh, as to when to mask. No? Uh, one is the smoking rule. No? Uh, if you're inside the room, 
and if you if you assume that somebody were smoking, and if you could smell the smoke, you know, then yes, no, you need to wear a mask. No, but if it's the room is so large or the ceilings are so high, no, na, you don't think na, you would smell smoke if someone were smoking. No, you don't need to. No. There's also the most vulnerable rule. No? So if you're in a room with a group of, of people, no, family or friends, no, uh, try to identify who's the most vulnerable, no? elderly, persons with comorbidities. No? If that person is up to date with his or her vaccinations, meaning boosted, no? then you don't need to wear a mask because no? even the most vulnerable person is protected. Um, <clears throat> some people have been asking no, whether do we have to mask, uh, wear masks forever? Uh, with community transmission of COVID so low, no? maybe not against COVID, no? but uh, we also see that um, over the past two years by wearing masks no? and probably also practicing other behaviors like uh, hygiene, good ventilation and distancing. No? That's from other causes no? have, other, have actually uh, also gone down. No? So this is this is an analysis of uh, the the PSA report no, on excess mortality no, during uh, the pandemic. No? So we see that over the past two years, no, uh, there actually been a decrease in pneumonia deaths, and in deaths due to chronic uh, pulmonary disease, no? uh, bronchitis or emphysema. No? So that fewer twenty three thousand. 23,000 deaths due to pneumonia and about 4,000 no, due to COPD. No. Uh, not only that, no, uh, if we look at infectious diseases, no, actually over the past two years, no, all infectious diseases that are na not named COVID no, have actually had actually lower morbidity, uh, mortality. No. Infectious diarrhea no, from uh, the hygiene practices respiratory TB no, uh, from masking, no, sepsis, then again no, from staying indoors, no, and then even measles. So decrease no, across the board no, uh, uh, for infectious diseases. No? So uh, there's some benefit to, uh, actually a lot of benefit from masking no, and pr probably also hygiene behaviors. Okay, what about the environment? No? So we know that uh, COVID is airborne, no, aerosolized. Uh, uh, this is how you can or should protect yourself no, in terms of designing uh, ventilation no, for for your buildings or rooms. No. Uh, first, make sure that there's cross ventilation, no, intake and excess of air. Um, if you want, you can install, install uh, window fans no, uh, or put HEPA filters, no, although these are uh, very expensive. No. So uh, since we're a tropical country, no, uh, uh, we can open windows or doors no? uh, and not be afraid of the cold. No? Maybe the only downside is pollution. No? Uh, if we're in an air conditioned room, no? uh, we have to reconfigure our air conditionings. Now we have to install what they call the MERV 13 filters. Now these are the filters that are, these are high quality filters no? that uh, also filter out uh, viruses. No? Uh, also ventilate the, the room before and after uh, uh, the work day. No? And also even maybe even add air purifiers. No? Uh, one thing more everyone can do is uh, to have this carbon dioxide uh, sensor no? uh, inside the room to monitor uh, whether or not it's safe. No? So the safe level is uh, 1,000. No? less than 1,000 parts per million no, of carbon dioxide. No? So as long as you have ventilation that can keep it that low, no, uh, you're most probably safe no, from uh, infection because carbon dioxide can say is a proxy no, for the virus. No? Uh, if it's exhaled by people and it's not ventilated, you can imagine that if you have an infected person inside the room, uh, the virus is also not ventilated out. Uh, how about seasonality? No? Uh, in temperate countries, no, there's a strong seasonal association between uh, temperature no, and and virus and, and, and surges. No? Only because when it's cold, people tend to stay indoors. No? 
uh, in the Philippines, no, and this is uh, a, a graph I made uh, comparing the, th the three years, no, well, two and one fourth year no, that we have had. No, and this is uh, these are our seasons. No. Uh, there seems to be a relationship with the rainy season, no, maybe because people stay indoors, no, but not this, the association is not so strong no, with the other other seasons. So we can't tell for sure, no? If there's an association, it's probably very weak. No? So in conclusion, no? uh, first, uh, <clears throat> first a warning, no? uh, we, saw, we see a, uh, a low number of cases now, but they're probably underestimated, no? Uh, Omicron is still the dominant variant we have, no? And people with mild Omicron symptoms might not even get tested. And there's also more widespread use of, of home antigen tests, no? and these are also not reported no? to, to government. No? Uh, also, many people are done with the pandemic, no? even though the pandemic may not be done with them. No? So uh, as we see in Europe, no? even if they've had BA2 surges, no? uh, governments continue to uh, reduce res restrictions. No? So the response to a wave is not similar as to previous waves. No? Uh, we see that interest in vaccination is also waning. No? So for the past weeks, no, uh, our daily vaccination rates range from maybe 200,000 no, to, or even less. No? Uh, so if, if the cases reports are not uh, that accurate, no, we're left looking at hospitalizations and deaths, which are more accurate indicators, no? but these are lagging indicators. No? By the time we see them increase, no? we, we already know that there's a large wave of cases no? behind it. Okay, so let me conclude by going back to the epidemiological triad. No? So how do we prevent another surge? No? So instead of answering the question, uh, will there be a, another surge? No? How do we prevent it? No? <clears throat> uh, for most of virus behavior, there's nothing we can control uh, about whether viruses become more transmissible, more severe, but we can prevent mutation by controlling transmission or spread. No? Um, we can also try to improve indoor air quality and monitor uh, whether that improvement has worked. No? Uh, but this is, I mean, if we could do just one thing, no? this is the, thing that we should focus on, no? build a higher and more solid immunity wall. No? Uh, people who need to be boosted should get boosted. No? People who are, in who are not vaccinated should get vaccinated. Uh, and as uh, vaccines roll out for children, no? uh, we should get our children vaccinated also. No? Uh, and of course, observe the three out of four rule, no? even though community transmission is low. Uh, I think that's my last slide. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, that's Dr. John Wong. And, um, ay, naku, magaling talaga si John Wong, no? Grabe. Mamaya, papanoodin ko to ulit. I, I, um, I advise you also to go over it, to share it with others because he really made a presentation that was so logical. And John, you're going to see the appreciation of our, of our community, no? And thank you so much for your time in preparing this. I'm sure you did everything to pull in the latest data, pero napakahusay po talaga, no? napakalinaw talaga nung pag-explain niya. So, uh, the messages are very clear for us. And um, we have one more speaker who Raymond's gonna, gonna introduce and we'll have our, our um, Q&A and open forum. So, go ahead, Raymond. Thank you, Dr. John. Uh, really very informative, just as always po. No? And we look forward to you being able to um, answer questions later on during the fo open forum, sir. Uh, for our next speaker, uh, she is an expert on molecular biology and, and genomics po, no? And currently, she is the executive director of the Philippine Genome Center. Please welcome back sa ating webinar and onto your screens, uh, executive director, Dr. Cynthia Saloma po, all the way from Bohol. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Raymond and Dr. Susi. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity to talk again in our program, uh, Stop COVID. Yeah. So I'm going to uh, start my presentation. Is my uh, sound coming in loud and clear? Yes, ma'am, go ahead. Okay, so I will, I will declare 
uh, no conflict of interest. And then I will proceed with my uh, presentation. So this is the Global Genomic Epidemiology in SARS-CoV-2. As of April 8, 2022, there are now 496 million confirmed COVID-19 cases and nearly 6.2 million deaths worldwide. In our country, we have, a record, we have recorded 3.680 million cases and about 59,000 deaths. The global epidemiology of SARS-CoV-2 shows the emergence of variants of concern towards the last quarter of 2020. And these variants show greater transmissibility, immune evasion capabilities, or increased pathogenicity, which have been designated with Greek letters uh, by the WHO. So in December 2020, we saw the emergence of the alpha, first detected in the UK, and then we also have the beta variant first detected in, the, um, so in South Africa, the gamma variant where we only have found three in the country. This is first detected in Manaus, Brazil. And then there is an appreciable detection of the Delta variant, which happened in India in April of 2021. And this was followed by, indeed by a very, very rapid global rise or spread of the Delta um, variant because of its high transmissibility and rapid replication rate. And of course, some people say that it drove uh, essentially the global third wave of COVID-19. On November 26th last year, 2021, the WHO added to the list a VOC with a designation of B.1.1529 in Pangolin, and this has been called the Omicron variant. So if you look very, very closely at the latest data, this is the data from GSAID or the Global Initiative on the Sharing of All Influenza Data. As of April 5, 2022, we can see that nearly 100% of sequence cases worldwide is comprised of the Omicron variants and related lineages. So there's actually a lot of Omicron. You have BA point X, and I'll explain that later. So if you look at the um, data around the world, uh, in different uh, continents, in Africa, in Asia, in Europe, in Oceania, in North America, as well as in South America, nearly 99% of sequence cases lately in the past month are really comprised of the Omicron variant. So here in the next slide, I'm showing to you the emergence and evolution of the COVID-19 variants of concern in the Philippines. So the Philippine Genome Center with a, in partnership with the Department of Health Epidemiology Bureau has sequenced more than 28,000 uh, cases of SARS-CoV-2. So if you look very, very closely at this graph, you see here uh, between January to July or August of 2021, the detection of the alpha variant, side by side with that, is the detection of the beta variant. And then, of course, towards the tail end um, uh, of the beta, the alpha wave, would be the emergence of the delta variant that um, we have detected up to December 27, 2021. Um, towards the third week of December, the Omicron variant has already been the dominant variant in the Philippines. But what is the key message of this uh, phylogenetic tree? When you look at the emergence and evolution of the variants of concern of SARS-CoV-2, we notice that none of the variants of concern led to the next variant of concern. That is to say that beta, this one, did not arise or is a mutation of the alpha variant of concern. So could we say that the Omicron arose as a mutation of delta? These variants of concern came out as independent mutational events, perhaps in an individual who is immune compromised and with chronic infection, or even in an animal host, allowing the virus to mutate and explore the mutation space to come out with a variant that is most advantageous to it. There was a previous concept that the variants would evolve in a ladder-like pattern of evolution, that is, it would gradually change as the mutations accumulated. This concept has been blown out to the wayside with the emergence of the alpha variant, which emerged in the UK in September 2020. 
Please note that the alpha variant was not related to any of the main SARS-CoV-2 lineages circulating in the UK at the time. The same thing happened with the beta variant uh, detected in South Africa, and then again with the Delta variant first detected in India, and now the Omicron variant first reported in South Africa and Botswana. So this is a map of the Omicron, uh, Omicron variant or Omicron sub-lineage. And you can see, for example, that in the beginning of 2021, the Omicron cases worldwide, the dominant was the BA.1 sub-lineage, whereas uh, in the Philippines at this time, even if globally it was very, very low, the BA.2 sub-lineage was already our most dominant variant in terms of sequence cases. But now, uh, in the month of May of March and April, we see that the BA.2 comprises 95.4% of sequence cases uh, submitted to the global uh, database called GC. To answer the question of will there be more variants, will there be common surges, it will be worthwhile to look at the mechanism that drives viral evolution. I think Dr. Uh, Jan Wong a while ago has already discussed this to a certain extent. So we have here the current SARS-CoV-2 outbreak has been presaged by previous outbreaks in the same virus phylogenetic tree, including the SARS-CoV-2, uh, SARS in 2003, and the MERS outbreak in 2012, all with zoonotic or animal origin. This pattern of animal viruses being introduced to the human population makes it inevitable that epidemics and future pandemics will happen. What drives viral evolution in the first case? SARS-CoV-2's key feature has been its propensity for genetic recombination across host species with its genome bearing the footprint of multiple recombination events as it moves from host to host with possible contributions of mobile genetic elements randomly inserting in the viral genome while it is in the host cell. So viruses also mutate in response to the host immune system as well as to the pressures from the environment. Because of their short generation times and large population sizes, viruses can evolve very rapidly. So I have already presented these definitions of what is a mutation, what is a variant, what is a lineage, and what is a strain. So just to emphasize to you that we are using a phylogenetic tree based on pango, or pango lineages. So pangolin means phylogenetic assignment of named global outbreak. So whenever I mention something like B.1.1.7 or the alpha variant, this really based on the pangolin nomenclature system. So in the next slide, I'm going to uh, review or to, to bring our audience to some of the keywords on the lineages and sub-lineages of our current variants of Kutse. So none unknown to many, we always report about the detection of the alpha variant, or the beta variant, or the gamma, or the delta, or the Omicron. But of course, internally within the gamma or the uh, within the delta or the Omicron variants, we report through the Department of Health Epidemiology Bureau. We know, for example, their sub lineages. So what are these? For example, in the alpha variant, um, we barely see out the alpha variant now. The sublineages are assigned Q.1 to Q.8. And so this has been overtaken by Omicron, as we all know. Then the beta variant, we have a 0.1 or B.1, 0.351, 0.1, up to 0.5. Okay. For the gamma variant, I mentioned to you that in the Philippines, since the beginning of our genomic based surveillance effort, we have only detected three gamma variants. Um, apparently, there are also P.1.17, but mostly these are, they are located in, uh, found in Brazil as well as in other countries in South America. Then we have the delta variant. So we have B.1.617.2. So this is the pango lineage. However, there are a lot actually of sub-lineages, more than 200 uh, uh, sub-lineages of delta, and that reflects to the rapid mutation and spread of the delta variant around the world. So when you see the word or the uh, sublineage 
AY, 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.4, up to AY 133, these all refer to the subdivisions of the delta variant. So this has been um, the, uh, the delta variant was first detected in India in October 2022. And uh, it was designated early last year in May 11, 2021 as a variant of concern. Now let's go to the Omicron variant with a pango lineage number of B.1.1.529. So when the Omicron variant was um, um, named by the WHO and was considered as a variant of concern, there were oh, actually three sub lineages, not just B.1.1.529. There were actually B.1, this is sub lineage B.1, which actually was the first to become dominant around the world. But now in March of 2022, we have BA.2. And you notice some countries such as Denmark, which has first had the BA.1 wave, also the same as in the UK, they are now um, experiencing the BA.2 wave. And then we have also B8.3, which is uh, which is really, really very few numbers, some of which have been found in Africa and also in Portugal. So B8.1 alone has a sub-lineage of up to 19. So you have B8.1.19. Then we also have for B8.2, we have up to B8.10. Okay, so many of these were detected in September or November of 2021. So I would like to bring your attention now to BA.2 um, in a short while, but I'll just try to introduce that in the BA.2 sublineages I mentioned about uh, 10, right? So there are actually, for example, one that is closely identified for the full piece. This is BA.2. 0.3 and that comprises 97% of the B8 of the Omicron lineages in our community uh, cases. So that's 97% of sequence cases from community samples are B8.2.3. And we would like to believe that B8.2.3 first started in the Philippines. We have gone into the global database and the earliest case of B8.2.3 was actually recorded and or submitted by the Philippines on December 2, 2021 from a sample in Mindanao, from a community sample, not from an other community. So the one that was reported in Hong Kong is BA, a sub-lineage BA.2.1, that's a UK lineage. Hong Kong is BA.2.2. So the Philippines is circulating about 97% of the cases we have in the community is BA.2.1. Point three. The one in Japan seems to be like a baby of B8.2.3. So the Japanese lineage is now B8.2.3.1. So it's an offshoot of uh, the Philippine lineage and, and other countries. And this has been also reported in Singapore, in Hong Kong, and in Japan, probably from Philippine travelers. The one from Singapore lineage is B8.2.4. And then you also have 0.2.5 in Portugal and other countries. For France, it's 2.6. In the US, it's 2.7. UK again, 2.7, because UK has a very robust genomic by surveillance system. And then we also have the B8.2.9, which is the European lineage. So I would like to show to you here the, um, the latest data uh, in terms of the cases that we have observed in the Philippines. So as of April, 8, April 7, yesterday, we have recorded 278 uh, cases. So as mentioned also by Dr. Wong, this might be an underestimation because most of the time people will either go rapid antigen test or if there's really no need for this or hospitalization, many people have very, very mild symptoms or no symptoms and they do not get tested. But at any rate, we have 278 confirmed uh, cases yesterday, most likely, if these are community transmissions, most likely B8.2.3. We compare that with cases, so you can see here that we have a case, this is our Delta wave, this is our Omicron wave, which happened and peaked in January 15, 2022. So you have here in the Philippines, we peaked very early, and that was driven not by B8.1, but by B8.2.3. Now, we also have here cases in Indonesia. Indonesia, with a population of more than 200 million, has recorded about 2,000 cases only. So you see the, uh, 
the graph of the Philippines and Indonesia are very, very similar. Now, we are also looking at our neighboring countries, are uh, looking at Malaysia, Thailand, and Singapore. If you look at the cases in Malaysia, probably they have reached a peak and the tail end is still, um, still a little bit long. Uh, hopefully, they have already um, seen the peak of cases and they're just going to go down. We hope so. In Singapore, also, the uh, for a country with about 5 million, 5 million population, they actually experience a daily case of more than 25,000. That's really, really high, but the death rates or the case fatality rate in Singapore is also very low. Now we look at cases in South Korea. At one point in South Korea, the daily case is more than 600,000. Um, in Japan, it also reached about 120,000 a day or more and uh, Vietnam also uh, nearly 200,000 a day. So for some of these countries and um, from some of our neighboring countries, hopefully they have already reached their peak and now on the decline. But we also noticed that the tail end is a little bit low as compared, for example, to the one that was experienced by Indonesia and the Philippines where the, the, the tail or the, down, the, the low number of cases after the, reaching the peak was really achieved at a very, very short period of time. Okay, so we, are, we have often been asked, what could be the possible uh, explanation for the cases, the low cases in Indonesia and the Philippines? Could it be because um, of the vaccines they have been using, the innate immunity of individuals, prior um, exposure, and so on and so forth? I think this could be a, due to a combination of factors. So let's look at the emergence and evolution of the COVID-19 variants in the Philippines. The same pattern of VOCs such as Alpha, Beta, and Delta, followed by the Omicron variant, was observed. So I remember I said to you that it's not a ladder-like um, emergence of these VOCs. They came from out or, or somewhere, and then they became the dominant variant. Because of uh, movement and mobility restrictions, probably border control measures and other policies, the introduction and spread of the Delta variant in the Philippines was actually delayed by about two months compared to Asian neighbors. But the Omicron wave in the Philippines peaked earlier compared to the experience of Delta. We saw our highest cases driven by the Delta variant last September 15. Um, our ASEAN neighbors, for example, in Indonesia, Malaysia, Thailand, and Vietnam, they experienced their peaks earlier in July or August of 2021. In contrast, I have mentioned our Omicron wave peaked early, probably January 15, 2022. Although the Omicron BA.1 was first detected here uh, by, uh, about November 21, 22 in Cordillera, this is community transmission. So we saw community transmission of BA.1 much earlier compared to BA.2. It really did not take root uh, here in the Philippines, whereas in Europe, you see first the BA.1 wave in the Philippines, we really did not experience a BA.1 wave. We immediately experienced a BA.2 wave, and not just BA.2, it's a BA.2.3 wave. You know, that was first reported um, uh, on December 2, 2021. So look at this. So um, just to emphasize to you that, of course, <clears throat> the daily cases of the country versus the daily deaths or the deaths from the alpha and beta, as well as the delta waves have been relatively high. Uh, the same could not be said of the Omicron wave, and this is also experienced by other countries. So we call this the decoupling. Uh, the decoupling. Um, this has been uh, observed in other countries, but we also saw that in our neighboring countries, because of the sheer number of cases, they're also experiencing uh, increased nominal deaths of uh, patients, particularly probably in South Korea as well as in Japan. So now I'm going to discuss about the BA.2 sublineages as well as the hybrid variants that we have observed. So these are the BA.2 sublineage mutations. Uh, these are in the ORF1A gene and the S gene as well as in the ORF3A gene. So the Omicron subvariant BA.2 uh, has about 10 sublineages, but locally we are BA.2.3. And what are the hallmark mutations of the Philippine BA.2 sublineage, or we call this BA.2.3? We have observed two key mutations in the ORF1A uh, gene here. This is a substitution mutation at position 2909 from um, 
element to valine. And from ORF3A, um, we also now observe an L to 140F mutation in these ORF3A gene. And these, both of these, these double mutations comprise 97% of the detected local Omicron cases. And these are the distinctive mutations that are identified with the BA.2.3 uh, sublineage. So now, these are the latest Omicron sublineages and the local distribution in the Philippines. So these are all color coded. You will notice that mostly it's all purple. Of course, purple is also the color of the Philippine Genome Center. It's BA.2.3 that is widespread in the Philippines. If you see this map or this table, this is from November. So the last, the first time uh, Omicron was reported by South Africa and Botswana and also Hong Kong. We mapped our cases, T sequence cases by the PGC from November to March of 2022. So November, 2021. So you can see here that we have very, very few um, B8.1 cases. In December, we have an uptick of cases. Uh, of course, uh, we in towards the tail end of November, our cases are really, really low, of January to February. So in total, we have sequenced about 5,935 cases. But if you're going to differentiate or to look at this very closely, so by the way, uh, everything with B8.1.1, these are all the B8.1 um, um, sublineage, which was predominant around the world. So it's very few. Uh, we have de detected this in the Philippines, but it did not really take root. But what we have would be a lot of B8.2 cases. So if you look this at this very closely, look this one. These are the lineage, the B8.1, the globally dominant lineage prior to B8.2's increase or rise in February and March of this year. You will notice that among our local cases, 4,991 over 5,029 are BA.2.3. So I just see the dominance of the BA.2.3 in our community of these measures. Some people were saying that uh, we opened the economy or, or we allowed people to come into the country because there was an election. Actually, the decision of the IATF was really driven by data. It was because we realized and we reported to the IATF that the local transmission or the local cases in the Philippines are driven by community transmission rather than fresh introduction events from our airport. And that's why it was more logical to indeed open our borders because the cases that have been spreading are really B2.3. So, but if you will notice that our uh, of returning overseas Filipinos, even if they have B.2, it's very likely that it's not the B.2.3 version. And a lot of our ROFs are B.8.1. But as far as our local alternative cases, it's B.8.2, B.8.2.3 with those two mutations that I mentioned to you previously. If you look at the phylogenetic tree uh, and the emergence of this B8.2 and the two mutations, we would like to surmise that this B8.2 has been introduced in the Philippines earlier and has acquired these two additional mutations silently until such time that the mutations have made them um, highly transmissible. Now let's look at the hybrid variants. So this is another take on the graphics. So these, um, uh, I would like to thank uh, Aaron Pangilinan of the DNA uh, of the core facility for bioinformatics for doing this uh, for this presentation. So this is a map of the B8.1 mutation. So you know that the, um, the genome of the SARS-CoV-2 is about 29,903 bases. Okay, so this is uh, the map. So this is the signature mutations of B8.1, we know that they are really, really a lot of mutations. And B8.2, these are the signature mutations of B8.2. So some of the mutations of B8.1 and B8.2 are shared, but other mutations are specific to the family image. And then we have here Delta AY.4. Why Delta AY.4 is shown? Because the other XD, for example, and XF are really AY.4 sublineage of Delta. The lineage AY.4, so this is Delta, by the way, and there is up to AY.1.133. Uh, the AY.4 is actually the dominant uh, Delta sub lineage in Europe. Okay. So if you look very closely here, you can see this is the signature mutation of B.1, 0.2, and then Delta. XD 
is a combination of delta AY.4 and BA.1. So you can see BA.1, this one is very similar. And then these are the others are of course sure delta. So um, the blue of the red ones, the box ones, are the BA.1 donor segments. You can see very, very similar. How about XE, which is this, um, a topic of interest for many people? XE, in contrast to XD and XF, is a combination of the two Omicron sublimits. So for XD and XF, it's a combination of Delta Omicron. Delta Omicron. But XE is BA.1 and BA.2 combination. Actually, a lot of the XE is BA.2 with some BA.1 um, uh, hybrid uh, recombinant sequences. So you see here, you can see very, very clearly that XE has a lot of the mutations, signature mutations of BA.2 and a few of the BA.1 mutations, okay? So, to summarize, you have the XD, which is Delta AY.4 Omicron BA1, uh, it's a recombinant lineage of Delta and BA.1. This was first reported in France and Denmark, and the earliest sequence was on January 17, 2022 in France. The most recent is February 5 in the Netherlands, but there's nothing much we can uh, say about the XD because it seems to be circulating only in these three or four countries in Europe, not Belgium, Netherlands, France, and of course, Denmark. How about XD? So I said to you that uh, BA uh, is an Omicron-Omicron hybrid of the two Omicron subvariants. This reported in the UK, in Israel, in Thailand, also in Taiwan. So far, it has infected about 637 people in the UK. It has three mutations not found in the parent sub sequences or parent sequences. Um, they say it's probably more transmissible by 10% compared to the original already transmissible, highly transmissible BA.2, but the evidence is still lacking. So we're still, uh, and this is really under closely, uh, close monitoring. The XF is again a Delta AY.4 Omicron BA.1 combination detected mostly in Britain and so far about 39 people have uh, uh, been uh, confirmed to have this XF hybrid Omicron uh, variant. So what are the key points of my presentation today? It is that mutations occur as part of the natural process of virus evolution and that recombinant variants crop up and sometimes or most of the time they tend to disappear on their own. Of course, because of these, there should be and we continue to have a robust genomic-based surveillance system in order to track these new variants and also to study very fast you know, the clinical presentation. Based on available evidence, the current couple of vaccines are still effective against our four new variants, although they may have diminished efficacy. The third shot of booster could block the immune escape mechanism of Omicron, and some countries are actually contemplating on the fourth booster because of the possibility of waning immunity from the vaccines. And vaccine designers need to design a new crop of vaccines that are protective against emerging variants, with the alternative being an annual dose of variant-specific or multi-editor vaccines. So we really need to um, challenge our vaccine designers if they can design a vaccine that is resistant or is able to um, provide us protection even in the face of the emergence of new variants. So with that, I would like to end my presentation and would like to thank the many laboratories around the country who have been sending samples to us, our close collaboration with the DOH Epidemiology Bureau and the young people of the UPPGC for their effort and sacrifices so that we can deliver to you these genomic uh, sequences of the SARS-CoV-2. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. That's uh, Dr. Cynthia Saloma. Nako, ang galing, no? Ang galing niya. Kailangan panuulin din natin ulito. Ako, I'm really so fascinated by the detail, the level of detail. And, you know, guys, um, so I think um, John was talking more about how you monitor people and the environment. But that's not enough, diba? We have to also monitor what's happening to the virus. And you can't do that without these really top caliber scientists like Cynthia and her team, no? Mga bata na nandun sa Philippine Genome Center. Ang huwusay nyo. So thank you so much. We are so lucky in the Philippines that we have this. 
that you're able to monitor the virus. Kasi iba yung mamonitor yung mga tao, nagkakasakit, sinong tines, etc. Iba yun. Iba yung tinitingnan nila yung virus. No? Ano ba yung virus na yan? And really so informative. So thank you very much, Cynthia. And again, I'm sure our community will be, uh, you know, clapping their hands again in, in the chat. But we thank you for putting your your effort into this presentation and for um for being here with us today. We know you're very busy. Okay, I'm going to turn over to Raymond. Raymond, over to you. Thank you, Dr. Susie, and thank you so much. Very informative again. Uh, ma marami pong laman talaga pag si Dr. Saloma nag-mention ng, ano, ng about, especially the genomic sequencing. Uh, right now, we'll we'll try to ask uh, our panelists, uh, so Dr. Eva, Dr. John, and uh, Dr. Rasincha to open their cameras po uh, because we will be moving shortly into the open forum. But before that, we'll take a very quick break for our special public service announcement today. Oh, sige na, anak. Parang kagat lang ng langgam. Kantik o yung kumikiliti lang. Ito naman, parang hindi ka pa nababakunahan dati. Akala ko pa naman, brave girl ka. Nakakahiya na kay Do. Okay lang po, nanay. Ay, ang cute naman ng shirt mo. Favorite color ko rin yan. Doc, favorite ka rin po ang color nito. Pero ayoko po ng red hunting. Masakit kumagat at takot rin po ako sa blood. Magtutugaw po ba ako sa bakuna? Ah, hindi. Walang dugo sa bakuna. Konting pisil lang, tapos na. Magkakasugat ba ako, Dok? Hindi ka magkakasugat. Lalagyan lang natin ng plaster pagkatapos para safe. Di ba nabakunahan ka na rin ng contra measles at chicken pox dati? Parang ganun lang din ang bakuna para sa COVID-19. Natatakot pa rin ako, Dok. Alam mo ang secret sa pagiging brave. Hindi ibig sabihin na wala kang kinatatakutan. Kundi, kahit natatakot ka, Hinaharap mo pa rin ito. Hmm, okay. Ready na po ako, Doc. Una, pupunasan ko muna ng bulak na may alkohol ang braso mo, okay? Tapos, mabilis lang na konting... Ayos! Tapos! Tapos na, anak. Pwede mo nang buksan ang mga mata mo. Nay, sabi sa inyo, brave girl na po ako eh. O, oh, heto ang price para sa sa'yo, ha? Wow! Bagay sa shirt mo. That's the color of bravery. Color in yan for love. Thank you, Doc. Thank you, Nay. Dahil ako po ay mahal ninyo, nagpabakuna na ako. Kaya mga bata, magpabakuna na kayo. Stay safe and stay well. Mga bata, magpasama na sa Bakuna Center. Thank you so much, TVUP. The COVID Communication Public Service Announcement is one of the many creative outputs of the Stop COVID Deaths team to push for the pediatric vaccination for children age 5 and up. Dr. Susie? Thank you very much, Tun. Tuwa ako. Ikaw yung doktor dun, di ba, Raymond? <laughs> the voice, Tuwa. the voice. Yes, po. Oh, we have more surprises for you coming up in the next coming weeks. But uh, So we've got everyone. We've got Eva, we've got John, and we've got um, Cynthia with us. And um, we'll get the ball rolling. Raymond's going to look at some questions from the from the chat box. But let me start by asking. Okay, so John told us about... Galing, yun, ni John, pinakita niya yung, ano, no, yung epidemiology yung, through a timeline. No? Cynthia naman, pinakita rin yung, yung monitoring biosurveillance, no? monitoring of the virus. So dalawa yung tinitingnan. <coughs> oh, excuse me. Now, question is, Hindi po to COVID, ha? Sorry, Raymond. <laughs> it's okay. Okay, teka. Okay, I got it. <coughs> question is, um, how prepared are we for, let's say there's another, kasi maganda yung sabi ni John, no? Just because it mutate doesn't mean that it gets weaker, right? And then when Cynthia was saying naman was that daming, ano, daming, Mutation, anak-anak, no? So how ready are we for, for another variant coming in? And, and I think one of the issues that was raised by both of you was that you could be seeing less numbers because actually, halos wala nang nagpapatest ngayon, di ba? I can't say that well, halos wala. But definitely, there's less testing going on. 
And I know Eva has been really instrumental in getting our testing capability up to the point where it is right now. So I'll start with Eva. No, parang from your point of view, are we ready for another surge? And if, if for example, this Omicron XE becomes you know, something bigger than what it is now, ano yung mga paghahanda na kailangan natin gawin? So we'll start with Eva. Thank you, Dr. Susie. What I'll say is um, I think everyone is now familiar with the alert level system that the government has put in place. And that those alert level system looks at disease situation, the daily number of cases, the healthcare system, how uh, the ICU beds are occupied. And uh, in terms of disease control, you really um, uh, accelerating, uh, no, sorry, increasing the number of our uh, uh, testing centers, especially for RT-PCR as well as gene expert throughout the country. I think right now we have more than 320 testing labs. And then of course we have the genomic biosurveillance in place. So if you'll, the, the alert level systems that the government has implemented since uh, October, I think, or sometime late last year has allowed us to look at these parameters and then um, um, make our responses accordingly. And uh, I think those are important because we have to approach this from the whole of uh, government and, and whole of uh, society. That means everyone looks at the same um, numbers and the same, uh, and will coordinate a, a response that, that um, that encompasses all the, the agencies of the government. So are we better prepared to answer the question, are we be better prepared for, a, for the emergence of a new variant? I, I'm thinking we are, um, but it will require all of us to have this coordinated effort. That's my short answer, ma'am. Yeah, thanks, Eva. John, what is your thinking on this? You've been in the heart of this now. What do you think? Are we are we really now better prepared or are we going to scramble again if something happens? John, go ahead. Uh, so I, I go back to my framework. No? So uh, first, it will depend on what the next variant will be. No? Uh, is it, does it cause more transmission? More importantly, is it more virulent? No? So if it is more vir virulent, what we need to prepare for is uh, hospital beds, no? ICU ventilators. No? Um, although we have we have developed surge systems now no, that allow us to expand and reduce uh, our hospital capacity as needed. No? But uh, over the past two years, I think what what we needed to have done is uh, to actually set up uh, uh, ICUs no, in at the provincial and city levels. No? Uh, right now, there's a, there's still some regions where uh, they have to send patients to the regional center, you know, in order just in order to access uh, ICU ICU capacity. You know? So instead of having this surge capacity, or in addition to having this surge capacity, uh, I think we need to actually build you no know, uh, ICU critical care capacity at the provincial and uh, city levels. You know? uh, this. This period that we have now, very low cases, no? uh, unless we have better vaccination rates, no? uh, I would call this uh, no? uh, the interval between surges. No? So no way is the pandemic over. No? So, but we should also call this stage the preparation stage. No? Uh, so prepare in terms of uh, hospital bed capacity, but also in terms of uh, testing capacity. No? We can we can react or we'll be reacting late, no? Uh, if we don't see the cases coming, and if we only see the the uh, hospitalization rates uh, go up, no? so uh, I think we there's still a need there. there uh, we still need to do a lot more, no, to to be better prepared. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, John. Let me pick up on something you said before we go to Cynthia, no. Kasi ano no parang sabi mo kung more virulent tribes mean mas mabangis mas mabangis yung virus we have to be prepared to take care of patients no and um, we've been talking about this for some time no na dapat we have more uh, ICUs more infectious disease training for both doctors and nurses 
at the level of the province. In fact, at the level of the district, there are district hospitals around the around the country that can be converted. No, pwedeng pwede kasi meron tayong mga infection control designated. At the local level, as long as meron tayong mga trained na, na tao. No? But I, I really like that point. No? Na we have to think about, uh, we have to have kind of like a problem tree, which is like, is it more transmissible, more virulent, or both? Diba? Kasi nakita natin sa Beijing, eh, nagpatayo na naman sila ng, ano, eh, ng isang katutak na isolation isolation centers. And if you were monitoring media, no, they were really you know parang hinuhuli ng pulis yung mga nagte-test positive no and they were really closing down neighborhoods so iba naman ang approach nila no and of course very difficult to to do that anywhere else uh china is very difficult dif- different as 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 i would say right but i i like your point that we have to be thinking about what are the options what are the possibilities here kasi tama yun eh this is this is a lull no parang walang bagyo ngayon Kaya kailangan ready tayo pag nagkaroon ng next pagyo, di ba? Kung more transmissible siya, anong dapat handa natin? Kung more virulent siya, ano yung kailangan natin handa? So I think this is these are very, very strong points. So let's go to Cynthia, no? Kasi being able to monitor that virus, to see that virus, kasi sabi natin, ano, I'm sure in the audience, sabi niya, no? parang hindi natin makita ang kalaban. Actually, si Cynthia, nakikita niya yung kalaban. Alam niya kung anong klaseng itsura noon, sanang sinong nanay at tatay noon, saan ba siya nagsistay, gano'n. So Cynthia, you know, with, with this period, this lull period, um, are we advancing in terms of our preparation to visualize and to identify any new variant? Oh, uh, thank you for the question, uh, Dr. Sisi. Um, actually, there are efforts to um, strengthen our genomic based surveillance to couple the sequencing with the assay system so that if ever we see mutations, we can immediately test functionally whether that has a higher um, attachment capacity, it increases the doubling time or the replication of the virus. So those uh, preparations that process are increased, including a um, pseudovirus testing facility within uh, UP Diliman, and of course the possibility also of um, uh, isolating the virus and testing, testing them with your variants. So that is at the level of the sequence, because for example, Sequence-wise, we, we can predict that uh, the possibility of these uh, virus to have to probably have higher immune evasiveness, but we just have to test. So there should be a mechanism by which we can test that very fast. So that is one. The other one, Dr. Susie, is of course it will really be dependent on the nature of the variant that is coming. And number three, Dr. Susie, of course, you are you need to strengthen our genomic based surveillance effort in the country. At the Philippine Genome Center, we have already been inaugurated three more. And I think there are other Sentinel sites that are being up, but uh, that is still all um, in the planning stage. So we need to strengthen this genomic based surveillance system to have epidemiologists, statisticians, of course, genomicists bioinformaticians in the team, um, and that is for around the country, including, of course, in the testing of environmental samples as well as zoonotic infections. Um, and if there is something that we have also learned that has become very prominent during this pandemic is the fact that we really, really need to strengthen the healthcare capacity of our provinces and cities. You remember um, when they were trying to do um, a high risk, et cetera, et cetera, you notice that some places really have very, very limited capacity for ICU and also, for, of course, for isolation. Some district hospitals are, uh, they tried to, uh, to upgrade to higher level hospitals, but indeed there is a really uh, a challenge. And I think um, for many LGUs, the WH, I think this law in cases should be a good opportunity for us to strengthen our population. We know that this virus will not go away. It will always be there. It's just a question of what kind of mutations it will right. present and whether it will, uh, of course, uh, um, um, what is the challenges it will present to our patients. Yeah, thank you very much. Thank you very much, Cynthia. I think, I don't know, sabi nga ni John kanina, yung UK, yun ang pinakamagaling sa, sa ano, no, genomic sequencing. Sana one day marinig natin, Philippines ang pinakamagaling sa Asia doon, di ba? 
Kasi the capacity is there, eh, but we just need to be serious and pursue it. Kasi I think, you know, sabi, if you cannot visualize the enemy, what, how are you going to fight it, right? And I think that's what you're doing at the Philippine Genomic Center. No? You're helping us visualize it so we know exactly what we are up against. No? So I think there are many lessons we are picking up. And I find it parang, parang lumilinaw, no? yung mga kailangan natin gawin sa health system natin. Napakarami, pero... Now. Okay, Raymond, um, let's look at the time. Raymond, uh, let's pick up some questions from the audience. Go ahead. Oh, I think we, we have time for a couple, Dr. Susie. Yeah, this one go. is the most upvoted. But to I think for a bit of context, um, we've discussed the possibility of having COVID pero hindi po nakakapture dahil um, hindi napapates, etc. And uh, and the question may be coming in from the fact that if you may have COVID and then you engage in certain activities such as bloodletting, bl- blood donations, etc. Uh, and the question reads, is it possible to transmit the virus via blood transfusion? Uh, and I think people have not heard anything uh, explicitly with regards to that especially any studies po we, uh, for that so for the benefit of our ano po, of our viewers uh, is that possible uh, that uh, you may have covid and you may be able to transmit it by a uh, blood si john siguro yan john what do we know about this uh, so far there have been no documented cases of uh, covid being transmitted no by by blood transfusion no uh but i think i know maybe the the evidence is that is that uh it's not yet complete because no? i don't think na, i haven't seen any studies where they actually looked for it no but so far uh through surveillance no? there have been no reported cases thank you okay. dr john um I'll, I'll piggyback on that topic in terms of surveillance you also mentioned um wastewater surveillance people are wondering uh ginagawa po ba yon hindi po ba siya ginagawa at Ano po ba yung kahalagahan ng paggawa ng wastewater surveillance po? Is that question for me? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Uh, so wastewater surveillance is looking for the for the virus in in wastewater, no? So that's been used successfully in the states, no? Especially when they opened up universities, no? They they're able to test uh, dormitories, no? Uh, and through that, no, identify. I mean, clear entire buildings and saying uh, there's no virus, there's no COVID here, and only select those dormitories that have uh, uh, co- uh, uh, the virus detected. No? So it's, it's very cost effective. Uh, the problem with doing that in the Philippines is that uh, nationwide, only 4% of households are connected to a centralized wastewater system. Uh, in NCR, it's only 8%. No? So it's not very useful here in the Philippines. So maybe in selected cases, no? maybe. Uh, dormitories inside UP or Ateneo, no. pero um, if it's used to identify buildings or clear buildings, uh, uh, that's that's not feasible. The most we can do is just maybe uh, test test uh, Pasig River or, or or Manila Bay and say that COVID is present or not. But we 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 already know that because we, there's there are already cases now. But uh, uh, that maybe uh, several decades down the line, no, it could be a, a useful uh, tool for us. Yeah, let me let me have a follow up to that, John, because you talked about carbon dioxide monitoring, no? And uh, Raymond, when you mentioned that, syempre, yung tenga ko, di ba? Kasi we used to do a lot of carbon dioxide monitoring for tobacco control, di ba? Um, and sabi nga ni ni John, pag nakamoy kayo ng sigarilyo ibig sabihin you know hindi maganda ang ventilation uh, ako nga sabi ko pag nakaamoy ka ng sigarilyo umalis na kayo doon di ba kasi parang, ano no parang uh, that that there is that's a the certain level of of air pollution no? but um to what extent are we recommending this as a proxy indicator for for ano no for poor ventilation because i think that could be really useful for ano you know, for uh, let's say uh Enclosed places, malls, and those carbon dioxide monitors—they're not actually very expensive. You know, they can be they can be bought by offices if they want to see kung magandang ventilation nila. Anong, 
what's your thinking on that using it in a more widespread way uh last year the there was actually already a joint doh dole guidance no or regulation that uh workplaces no, should uh well aside from the measures to improve ventilation they should also have carbon dioxide monitoring no in in office places in workplaces no uh but the problem with that is i know in I don't know how much inspection no, uh, or government monitoring there has been. Uh, for example, I, uh, when, when I go to new places, no, malls or restaurants, no, I always bring my portable carbon <laughs> dioxide oh, sensor. No? It's about yeah. 600 pesos yeah. long online. No? Yeah, yeah, so yeah. If, if it's less than 1,000, no, then I'm uh, I'm comfortable no, eating inside no? With, without without my mask. No? But uh, I've been to malls also, especially on... Uh, busy weekends no, where uh, the PPM, carbon dioxide PPM has increased to 1,005, 2,000. No? So uh, I can't say that uh, whether whether or not buildings or malls have improved their ventilation or are monitoring their uh, carbon dioxide levels. So we need to be better at that also. Ayan, cute naman ni John kung kundi sa restaurant, ginagano niya, o parang siyang James Bond. Tignan niya kung merong, merong mataas ang carbon dioxide and the cutoff would be 1,000, no? 1,000 ppm. Pag mataas sa 1,000, punta na kayo sa susunod na restaurant, parang gano'n. Yeah, okay. Sige, Raymond, go ahead. I think you have a few more questions before uh, do Dr. Eva has a comment po. And oh, Eva, 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 Eva. Eva. Yeah, Eva. Yes, uh, regarding the CO2 monitoring, uh, ma'am, I'd like uh, you to know that uh, there's an ongoing research at the NIH. We commissioned yeah. the group of Dr. Antonio Danz now to look okay. into this exactly, you know, yung use of CO2 monitoring, mon monitoring system in the household, in transportation system. So hopefully we'll, they'll have some results in a few months and um, maybe they can be featured in this DVUP webinar map. Oy, maganda yun. Yeah. Maganda yun, maganda yun. Tsaka ano, ano, parang ako, what I want to tell our audience is this, no? um, when we say we're monitoring uh, a disease, it doesn't always mean that you're monitoring the people. You can be monitoring the environment. Para ma mas preventive pa nga yun, eh, di ba? Parang hindi nyo monitor yung mga nagkakasakit, yung nagtitest positive. Pwedeng more preventive than that. Mamonitor nyo yung lugar na kung maaring nandun yung virus o hindi. You know, we're not looking at the virus, but we see it's a proxy, monitor, a proxy indicator or proxy, uh, a proxy monitoring system. Then if you have high carbon dioxide, it means that the air is not circulating well, no? And uh, again, right, um, you've seen from the presentations of Dr. Cynthia that we do have the capacity to, to actually also visualize and monitor the virus. No? So it's annoying. No? We, have, we have the tools that we need. I think in the Philippines, we have the tools that we need. Nandiyan yung husay at galing ng ating mga uh, dalubhasa. Pero kailangan lang talagang maabot ang lahat ng tao. No? Kasi baka sa ilang lugar lang no nangyayari yon so we really have to work work on that and and i think you know i really appreciate our presenters today kasi ang galing ang gagaling talaga nila you know, showing us really how how good how advanced we are no in our ability to do these things Raymond, do you have another question there? I mean, we're close to the top of the hour. It'll, it'll probably be our last question, Dr. Susie. People are asking, uh, since we're talking about it, and just based on the assertion of uh, Dr. John earlier that uh, we treat it uh, at this period as in-between surges. Um, the question, as a pediatrician for Ma'am Eva, uh, the FDA has already mentioned, I mean, within the context of that, multiple boosters in a year is not sustainable but also uh, in, in light of that and just because of the vaccination coverage that we have that we still need to improve upon has there been any discussion with regards to uh, vaccine additional vac additional boosters for vulnerable population like the senior citizen or immunocompromised which has been done in other countries ma'am uh you're asking me yes, yes okay uh, but dr dr john may also have 
uh, Samana. He reads all the newspapers from different parts of the world. But for well, from my from my part, I'd like to just say that yes, uh, there are already in other countries uh, um, steps to give booster, especially for the vulnerable population, after six months of having the the first booster shot, knowing too well that the vaccine wanes uh, within six months. So yes, the ans the short answer to that is yes. Doctor John. Uh, yeah, so in in mga immunocompromised, no? uh, people receiving anti-cancer treatment or people with connective tissue diseases, no SLE, no who receive immunosuppressive medicines, no? or organ transplant patients, no uh, should be treated as a special class, eh, no? Because uh, they've seen uh, sometimes even with boosters, no, they can get uh, enough an enough of an antibody response, no. In fact, in some countries, they've recommended a, for, a second, a fourth dose or a second booster no, for, for these populations. Now, they're also recommending that uh, these patients get antibody testing. Now, we don't usually test for antibodies after vaccination, but for this population, uh, some specialist, uh, specialty societies are recommending that they, they should get the antibody test after vaccination just to make sure that they have sufficient uh, protection. Yeah. Okay. Thank you very much, John. So I think we're running out of time. We're going to give you uh, a few minutes to think about your parting words for our audience from this really very, 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 very informative webinar that you've had. And um, I, I just, siempre may comment ako, Raymond, di ba? Parang Raymond, I don't buy the idea that we don't have money. Eh. Parang, <laughs> uh, ako, I can't, I, no, seriously, I feel like we can't afford not to do it. That's how I think about it. Parang I think, we have to annoy. We have to really think about an unusual amount of money that's going into uh, the response because unless we do that, our, our whole economy suffers. So, parang ano eh, kailangan, kailangan ng political will dyan eh, na yung pera, eh, put it together para marami ng genome center, di ba? Para maraming support for testing for whatever we need to do. Kasi we have the, we have the ability eh. Kailangan lang talaga yung tulak. Anyway, so let's go. Raymond, let's answer your questions and then do our our evaluation. Yeah, go ahead. Yes, thank you, Dr. Susi. Uh, we have our two questions. Babalikan lang po natin. Ha? Ito rin po yung pre-test questions natin. We had 736 of our Zoom attendees and uh, well, almost 100 in Menti to answer this. First question, what is Omicron XE? Uh, so ano po ba ang tamang kasagutan? If you had been listening po ang ating pong tamang kasagutan is really option 2, uh, hybrid of uh, 1 and 2 po siya. For the second question, anong mga bansa ang meron ng Omicron XE? Uh, I think it's uh, with the I think it's all of the above, no, Dr. Susie, uh, with the possible exception of U.S. because I have not seen anything from the U.S. Uh, okay, tanong, natin si, ano, tanong natin sa kanila kasi actually nagbabago yung information. John, what do we ah, know yes, about okay. this? John and, ano, and, uh, and, and um, Dr. Cynthia. And, uh, Cynthia, yeah. Is it U.K. lang ba or all of these countries have? I don't have, Doctora, I don't have yet confirmation of the U.S., but mayroon pa nga ano Taiwan no may wala din yeah. at saka Israel no pero yung US so far parang wala pang big news parang wala yung US okay John how about you ano alam natin diyan uh countries that have reported this new variant are 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 just countries who have very good genomic surveillance so they're they're not really the countries who who actually have the variant only no yeah. uh other countries may may still have the variant but they may not have been uh, doing enough sampling. Okay. So actually, when we prepared this question, we were saying, abangan natin kung anong lalabas. No? Sige. So Raymond, go ahead. Punta tayo sa evaluation. Thank you. Thank so you. Think, uh, yeah. Yes. Everything so, except the US, di ba? Parang everything ganun. except the US. Yes, that's uh, correct. Okay. Okay. Um, I think the latest was Thailand a few days ago. Um, thank you so much. So so we would we would like to emphasize po no that is a five question evaluation poll is not really there's no separate evaluation poll this is the one that we have always used so please uh, we enjoin our 800 plus attendees po to really put in your answers into this evaluation poll 
Uh, four point Liker scale. Uh, first question reads: The panelists demonstrated thorough knowledge of the topic. Number two, panelists were well prepared and organized. Number three, the panelists spoke clearly and audibly. Number four, the panelists used appropriate language with technical medical jargons adequately explained. And number five, the panelists contributed to new perspectives and knowledge on managing various key COVID-19 health issues. We will not be closing this up until the end of the webinar as we move on to the final messages from our speakers. Okay. Thank you very much. Let's have our parting words from uh, Dr. Cynthia. Cynthia, go ahead. So uh, to all our audience, I think um, we have many, many lessons learned during this pandemic. We are very glad that now the cases are really low and the hospitalizations are low, of course, we are always nervous every time uh, there are reported cases. But I think these, um, the whole COVID pandemic has given us the opportunity from the academy to work very, very closely with the DUH Epidemiology Bureau and also to have molecular biology in action. I think the, this pandemic has um, created a consciousness that molecular diagnostics is very, very important as part of our nation's response. And that the low cases that we are seeing now is probably a combination of cases and um, and the, the help of everybody from the government agencies who have been helping us uh, monitor and craft policy, as well as the many doctors, frontline scientists, local government officials, and everyone's cooperation. So I think this um, small, these low cases now, is really just a low. Um, let's take this opportunity to prepare very well and to strengthen our health systems and also to remind everyone that we should always continue to be teachers. Thank you. Very yeah. Much. Thank you very much, Dr. Cynthia Saloma of the Philippine Genome Center. Let's have uh, John. John, go ahead. Uh, thank you. So uh, if, if there's only one thing that we can do, no, it's, it's to get uh, everyone vaccinated. No? Uh, first, first priority should be the elderly because no? uh, 35% are not yet pr protected, but 70% no, are at risk. Uh, second would be children, because no, uh, they're starting to, to go back to school. No? Although they're at very low risk, no? uh, uh, they can still spread to uh, spread uh, infection within their households. No? Uh, so, um, whatever whatever setting you're in, no? uh, home, workplace, no? or most, no? make sure that you're in good you're in places that have good ventilation. No? Uh, uh, if you have control over over it, no, uh, uh, use a carbon dioxide sensor, but also try to help uh, improve the ventilation in the building. And then, uh, lastly, no, uh, I think we sh we still need to continue masking, no, with or without surges, no, because uh, as we've seen, no, it helps prevent uh, other diseases, no, um, uh, especially mga infectious diseases. Thank you. Yeah, thank you very much. That's, that's John Wong of um, Epimetrics. And let's go to uh, Eva, the Executive Director of the National Institutes of Health. Eva, go ahead. Thank you, Dr. Susie. Um, if in the beginning of the pandemic, we were running like chicken, headless chicken, I would like to believe that we've learned a lot in the last two years. And that's why I was very optimistic when I said my statements earlier about uh, whether us being better prepared for the pandemic, uh, I mean, for, the, for a, a new variant that will emerge. And I do agree with Dr. Uh, with you, uh, Dr. Susie and Dr. Wong, that we still need uh, many things to learn, new skills to, to acquire, as well as new tools to use to be prepared for future pandemics. But just three things. We need to keep our eye on our alert levels because they we need to familiarize ourselves with that because they are our early warning devices. No? Second is remember the basics. I think Dr. John also emphasized that staying in well ventilated spaces, uh, places avoid being in crowded uh, spaces, wearing the mask, uh, and then of course if we develop symptoms we seek help. And lastly, if we are eligible and there's already a move to get. Of course, have everyone who needs to be vaccinated, vaccinated. And if that time comes when boosters are already also in place or the, that fourth dose, I think we should also have that because it will still protect us from disease, severe disease and hospitalization. Thank you very much. 
Thank you very much. That's uh, Dr. Eva Kutyalka de la Paz, the head of the N National Institutes of Health. Okay, so unfortunately, we don't have Manchit or Charlotte or um, uh, whoever does our, <laughs> our closing summary. And I just like to summarize by saying, we opened with a question, uh, or Stella pala. You know, it's like, we, we opened with a question, are there more contagious variants like Omicron X? And I think the answer to this is yes, that's possible. That's possible that it's more contagious and it's also possible that there was something, something could be more virulent according to John. No? And alamin natin kung magkaka-COVID-19 surge ulit. So wala naman tayong crystal ball. No? We cannot predict what will happen, but I think all our speakers are agreed that we are not out of the woods yet. This is still... Uh, this is a good time for everyone because parang nag-surge, bumaba, okay. But we are closely monitoring what's happening in the rest of the world. As John said, we have to look at virus, host, and environment. Um, and, and we really have to um, use this time. Use this time to prepare. Wag tayong maligalig, natapos na. Now, there's many things that we can do, which our speakers have mentioned, and I highly encourage everyone to go to the playback, I'm going to do it. I'm going to watch it again because I thought we had really brilliant speakers today. So um, on that note, next week, wala tayo next week, Raymond. Teka, tulungan mo nga ako, Raymond. Wala tayo next week. It's Holy Week. So we will be taking a Holy Week break po for okay. next week and we will be seeing each other two Fridays from now. That will be April 22nd, I think. Yeah. Uh, 22 pa Which is... tayo, no? Saktong sakto, Dr. Susie, that's in line with our second year anniversary. Okay. Second year anniversary natin. Now, we have really bigatin mga speakers. Secret, we won't tell you who it is, but we're gonna talk about the pandemic and universal healthcare. Kasi, ano eh, no? parang na, nasabi na yan dati na ang solusyon talaga dito, universal healthcare. Pero, parang hindi hindi pa malinaw ang ang anon ang pagkaintindi natin kung anong connection ng dalawang yan. So we're going to have really uh, very uh, what should I say uh, celebrated speakers because it's Thought our second, yeah, second year anniversary and we hope to see all of you there, okay? And meron na naman mga pamimigay si Raymond. Kaya huwag kayong mag-absent. Tama ba 'yan, Raymond? May pamimigay ka? For Sa our internet. masusugid na mga televiewers, yes po. Okay, so meron tayong mga giveaways. Hopefully, you get them a little faster than last time. But that's just our little way of saying thank you to all of you. Kasi kung hindi sa inyo, wala kami dito. So over to you, Raymond. Thank you, Dr. Susie. We we really had a good time today learning more about uh, getting those in-depth information. But not to scare everyone off with regards to the likelihood of uh, search but really just to prepare ourselves kung mangyari man po iyon. Before we end our program, let us first acknowledge the very hardworking team behind the Stop COVID Deaths webinar series. Without each and every one of you, we won't be able to churn out quality content week in and week out. Doon naman po sa mga baka nagpapaantok or nas, nagko-commute or just really have some time sa mga breaks po nila, sa coffee break or lunch break or etc., we have prepared very, very uh, bite-sized po na mga videos which we call SCD Shorts. Ito po yung mga consumable po namin na magdali po talagang maintindihan at magets po kagad ang mensahe. Very, very short videos that you could find if you go to www.youtube.com forward slash tvup.ph And speaking of the YouTube channel of TVUP, you will be able to find all of our 94 webinars archived there if you go to the same YouTube channel po and then thereafter after this webinar po you'll be able to find all 95 webinars archived there you feel free to watch it on the playback po because there are really many nuggets of wisdom in each of the webinars that we have held we hope that you will have a safe and peaceful po no at uh, really healthy uh, na week long break uh, obviously we won't be able to see each other again but next week but hopefully that will give you some time just to reflect and to be able to prepare ourselves uh, na rin po. And, our, and our families and loved ones as well we are seeing on the screen at least uh, in the zoom uh, more than 90 Ninety percent for all of our more than ninety-one percent for all of our questions po no, in the evaluation poll. So maraming maraming salamat po 
sa lahat. Uh, this has been one of our really more informative webinars. We really thank our experts for that. Uh, and really uh, without each and every one of you hindi po namin uh, mapapagtuloy itong ating credible online community. So this formally closes our webinar for the week. We look forward to your company again during our next Friday, August 22nd which is our second year anniversary. It's a date. Together we can stop COVID deaths. So keep safe, keep healthy. See you online! The enemy remains unseen I'll keep your hand in mine Let's say a prayer one more time I know you long for home But I am here, you're not alone I'll stay with you until the coast is clear The others pain before my fears the others laugh before my tears But right behind the mask I look into myself and ask Do I have strength to carry on? My oh God, how long will this go on? I need you here to keep me strong I'm here to hold the line I'll keep my head Until my time Say his name to realize It's fine to be afraid Just hold on to the word he gave This time will come to pass Cause this salvation's made to last He'll carry you to see the break of day The others pain the from my fears the others laughs before my tears But right behind the mask I look into myself and ask Do I have strength to carry on? But God, how long must this go on? I need you here to keep me strong I'm here to hold the line I'll keep my head work Until my head dies From my fears, the others laughs before my tears, but right behind the mask, I look into myself and ask, Do I have strength to carry on? But God, how long must this go on? I need you here to keep me strong. I'll keep my word, you would is mine. The others pain before my fears. Pushing on the spine of tears Please take us through another day Just hold my hand And I will hold the line I will hold Oh, I